Hey everybody, how you doing? Doing so, all right. Who was that? Was that Zach? Yep. Hey. Um, yeah, I did not uh, post this ahead of time. I'm sorry about that. But uh, anyway, um, I was busy just now putting up um, this last week's uh, or this week's um, lesson for La Lima. So um, I just added a couple of things like on writing headlines um, and AP style. Um, but otherwise, it's the same, um, what you guys have seen before. Um, hi, Krista. Um, so, okay, uh, what I wanted to do with you all today was work on um, the, uh, what's it called, the uh, nut graphs. Um, and so what I'd ask you all to do, let me put in the link for it is look at um, examples of the nut graphs. I'm gonna, I guess, let me see. Um, if you guys go to our shared Google Drive folder, uh, maybe I should just give you the link to that. Let's see, can I do that? Does that have a link? Drive folder. Um, Let's see. Hello, hello. Welcome aboard, you guys. Um, so let's see, does this work? If I put this in the chat, you guys remember our shared folder, right? And if you guys go to the nut graph exercises, let me share my screen with you all. Here you go. So, um, you guys go to nut graph exercises. Oh. Oops, under shared drive, journalism 200. This should be us, right? And it's in this folder right here. And um, why don't you guys, well, let's see. Hi, Dr. G, I think it's locked for us. Like it says to request access for it. Okay, hold on. Give me a second. Um, all right, let me unlock this. Thank you. Okay, so. Hello, everybody. Um, let me do, why is it not? Okay. There you go. So, are you guys able to open this now? Nana, can you uh, open it? Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Hold on. Yes, I can now. You can? Okay, let me just make sure. Okay, yeah, you guys should all be able to open it now. And um, maybe let's start with, uh, let me ask you guys, uh, just as an open question, um, what is the nut graph? How would you explain what it is? The nut graph is like the explanation kind of of the lead, especially if you have like um, like a shorter or anecdotal lead, it's kind of like the, the um, explanation. 
That's right. So, more detail. so some of you guys are in, um, have, have either taken or in now Journalism 250, which is the hard news writing class or the basic news writing class, I should say. And uh, maybe one of you guys can explain what you're usually taught is like a basic news lead. What is that? So Nate, you, you took it, right, with, with uh, Brett. What is a basic news lead? A basic news lead is a lead-off sentence that uh, covers the time, date, and place of the news of the event. Right, well, uh, so question, quiz question for all you 250 folks. Does a basic news lead have to include all of the five Ws, who, what, when, where, and why? Does every basic news lead have to include that? What do you think? Who else has taken 250? Christy, you took it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mean, they say that it should, but I know a lot of news leads don't. Yeah. No, it 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 doesn't need to. In fact, it it off it really shouldn't because the point isn't to tag every base in your news lead. The point of a news lead is is what what would you say the point of the news lead is krista um to get like the the most important news out there first to get like the audience attracted towards the story right and a, and a, often a basic news lead tells a whole story in a sentence right have any of you guys written news leads that kind of tell the whole story in a single sentence? Everybody's kind of blank. Who else has had uh, 250? Anyone else? Um, Nina, you've had two, Nina, have you had 250? Um, I took it in the beginning of the semester, but I dropped it. So I don't oh, that's know right. Um, so, okay. So anyway, often you want your basic news lead to tell an entire story in the sentence, right? Um, like, let me share maybe one from, oh, somebody say something in the chat. Um, okay. Um, like here's, okay, here's a, they're doing these like because of the election and so much news going on, they're doing these short stories, but the New York Times will often run really, like the New York Times and the Washington Post often runs these really long and wordy basic news leads. But Attorney General William Barr said Tuesday, the Justice Department has not uncovered voting fraud at a scale. So in a way, that's a whole story in a sentence. Uh, it tells us the, the whole basic news in a sentence. Um, when, we talk, when I've talked to you guys about alternative leads and nut graphs, we're not doing single sentence news leads, right? We're opening up with a, uh, like a description or a picture or, um, you know, something that draws people in, right? Um, so then the nut graph delivers what, what ordinarily the lead would deliver, right? Um, and let's just take a look at, um, see if we can find first a feature on the New York Times homepage and also maybe look at what that opening looks like. Let's see, maybe this one. Okay, so this looks like the beginning of an alternative lead, right? In the spring of 2018 at the Montreal Insectarium, Stephanie Lee Tiron received a clutch of 13 eggs that he hoped would hatch into leaves. The eggs were not ovals, but prisms. So let me ask you guys this. Can you find on here where this anecdotal lead ends and the, um, the actual nut graph begins? Mm 
what did I do? Be, um, Mr. Lee Tarrant, the third paragraph. Let's see. Well, does it, is the story about his insectarium? Let's see. See, this is a longer story. You see, well, it's not that long. But it looks to me let's see. She baby nymphs with utmost care. Um Well, it seems to me like the you don't get into what it's really all about until Mr. Lee Tiran emailed a picture to Mr. Cummings who uh, confirmed what had now become obvious. The two species were in fact one and the same. The hatchlings had so solved a, uh, a century old mystery of the missing Nanophilium female. Since uh, 1906, we've only ever found males, Mr. Cummings said, and now we have our final solid proof. Uh, Mr. Cumming and Mr. Lee Tiran recently united the long lost species in one species, blah, blah, blah. So uh, this is a, this is kind of a long anecdote, right? That then we finally get the news here. Let's find a more straightforward example. Um, so, let me pull this one out. Where is it? Okay. So take a look at this and see if you guys can figure out where the alternative lead ends and the nut graph begins. And don't say it out loud, maybe wait until uh, other people, give other people a chance to find it themselves. Thanks, Nuna. Oh, thanks, Nate. So, okay, um, who, why don't I ask you guys this, somebody point out where the nut graph ends and then if you didn't figure it out, write down where you think it begins. And if, if you didn't figure out where it begins, um, maybe ask a question or see if you can figure out why you are mistaken about where it begins. So who thinks they know where the nut graph here begins? All right, I'll just wait. Let's see if any of you guys can figure it out. So anyone know yet? Is it where it says the 16 minute recording? Yes. How many of the rest of you? 
What? I was right there. I said I was gonna say that too because that's where it seems like like they're actually starting to tell the story, like where it begins explaining. But um, since it was like towards the end, I wasn't sure if they can do that or not. Right. So um, let's look at a couple more examples if I can pull them up on here. Let me uh, let me just see. Wait. So where does where does this one end? Where does it end? Uh, mm -hmm. I think it ends. I think it's both paragraphs, Nina. I think it ends. So the last two paragraphs. Yeah, I mean, what what we have. Well, this isn't the whole story. They're just giving us an excerpt of the story. They're just giving us the top of the story. So the story would keep going, but I think what we've got there is, um, you know, the the basic beginnings of it. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to see because I had pulled up a bunch of examples last time, I feel like we might need some more practice before we get into the exercise about this. Um, let me see if I have anything. Yeah, I don't have um, the three we used before, I don't think, let me see. Um, all right, well, let me uh, go over with you guys the four jobs of the nut graph, and then we'll just, we'll try and practice it with the actual exercise. I wish I had a couple more examples, which I had brought up last class, um, because I feel like you guys might need some more practice. Who, who had trouble figuring out where it started? Anybody? Um, all right, well, let me uh, pull up the, this uh, thing about the four jobs in the nut graph. So to go back to our shared folder, um, this is what I would say that the four jobs in the nut graph are when you write these. Tell us what the story is about and why we should uh, care. Does that paragraph that we just looked at do that? Uh, provide context uh, for us to see the story within the bigger picture. Um, so that means, like in this example that we just looked at, oops. Um, no one knows how widespread sexual blackmail is, but the case echoes other instances. Like you guys see how they're providing context here that you know puts this all in the bigger picture. Um, so that's really important to do in a nut graph. And that's one thing that distinguishes it from your basic news lead. Um, another thing it does that I, I would argue is that it it's a way, and this this helps you, which is very important as the writer, as much as it helps the reader which is that it lays out the structure, it sort of organizes the story. So what do I mean by that? Let's say the, the nut graph is four sentences long. The idea is that sentence A covers the early part of the story, sentence B covers the next part of the story, sentence C covers the third part of the story, and sentence D covers the fourth part. And then it all comes together in a way that that flows together like a paragraph. So even though you're laying out the structure, the whole, the whole paragraph should read well, and it should, you should read as one story altogether. Now, why do you think this is really helpful to you as a writer if you're writing a feature? Think about what you guys are going through right now in writing these or in putting together these, um, these final projects. Why would Part point uh, job three and job four of the nut graph be helpful to you as a writer? I believe that the nut graph is the most important paragraph in, the, in an article because it helps you to uh, organize your thoughts because I believe features are a little more difficult in the sense where you're, you're telling a story about a person, but it's also usually related to a bigger news event or something that happened to them that explains like a bigger 
phenomenon. So the nut graph is your way of tying it all together. And as a writer and as a, as a, as a writer, and then you're doing that for the reader as well. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, so are you guys finding that you're gathering lots of information here, there, and everywhere about um, your story, right? And then, um, or your, your project. And then it, once you've gathered a lot of stuff, it's difficult to know how to organize it or what it all means, right? So one thing that the reason why I'm, I'm making a real priority of writing a nut graph and I'm going over it with you guys today is because it's really important to be able to figure out what your nut graph is uh, in order to get your story together. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of times when I used to write features, I would spend more time putting the nut graph together you know, than I would writing the whole rest of the story because once I figured out what my nut graph is, um, I could easily fit all the rest of the pieces together. But getting the nut graph organized and getting that written is like the hardest part. So what I want you guys to do is um, I want everybody to look at these two, um, these two documents right here, this one and this one. Uh, altered Oceans and Filkins Leads and Nut Graphs, okay? And what I want you guys to do is read, read all of them through first and then see if you can identify where the alternative lead ends and the nut graph begins. So open them up and see if you can read through and figure out where the, uh, the nut graph begins. So these are examples of nut graphs. And then here's the Filkins stuff. So I'll give you guys, we're gonna do an exercise on this. So let me give you guys, um, everybody ha take 10 minutes to take a look at this and figure it out.
Oops. All right, let's take uh, like five more minutes. And see if you can get through all of them. I'm trying to dig through my past stuff to find those features that I pulled up for you guys last week. Well, no luck. Oh, here we go. All right, let me. Before we move on to those, let's try these. We'll do a quick lightning round. So let me pull you guys up and share my screen again. All right, let's try a lightning round. So, Nina, are you, uh, can you see my screen? Let's see. Yeah, sorry, I'm driving, so I'm listening. Oh, okay, you but, can't, uh, yeah, you can't really, okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm trying not to, like, <laughs> I'm trying to multitask. Yeah, I hear I you. I hear you, though, I hear you, though. All right, well, um, Isabella. When you look at um, this this story, you see what I'm sharing on the screen? Yes. Um, where does the alternative lead end and where does the nut graph begin? I want to say it starts, the alternative lead starts from the first paragraph where it says, finding the tomb of the ancient king's full golden artifacts. And then, um, well, let's I want- wait, hold on. Let's see. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I think I think I didn't give you enough screen for you to see it, where the oh. uh, where the nut graph begins. Did I? No. Mm, no. Is uh we have finding the tomb of an ancient king full of golden artifacts, weapons, and elaborate clothing seems like an archaeologist fa uh, fantasy. But searching for them, Gina Gasparro can tell you is incredibly tedious. And then it talks about how he has this interest in horse riding culture. He suspects there are thousands of tombs spread mm -hmm. across the Eurasian depths. As it turns out, uh, he has this friend who helped him with the search and they embarked on a new type of archeological analysis. Mm -hmm. 
And then this is where we get to the nut graph. A yeah, I was going to say that's where the nut graph started. Yeah, so that one's kind of tricky, huh? A little. Yeah. How about this one we did, if you remember, this is the one about the robot, mm -hmm. mom sniffing robot. And then this one. Um, maybe this one is a is a is a fair one to ask you about. So Isabel, can you you want me to read it out loud the whole thing? Um, what we um, got here? Sure. <laughs> okay. In one pandemic reality, restaurants are packed. There are no coronavirus limits at, a co at college town bars. No social distancing dots speckling floor, uh, speckling the floor. Some people are wearing masks, but even a weak proposal to make it a requirement in one city prompted an outcry. Welcome to South Dakota. In another, hundreds of miles to the south, much of life is shut down. No dining inside restaurants, capacity limits at Walmart, shuttered bookstores, museums, hair salons, parks. A mask wearing culture so widespread that someone put one on an old statue. Welcome to New Mexico. And then this is the view from America's two discordant uh, dissonant pandemic realities. Um, so where does the nut graph begin? I'd say it either begins um, where it says the pandemic and the nation's disjoint response to taking the notion of two Americas to a new extreme That's or, right. huh? That's right. Oh, okay. I was gonna say either that one or the paragraph after it, but I think it's the one where it says starts with the pandemic. Okay. So like generally, are the nut graphs starting somewhere towards the middle? Um, only, only in the sense that, well, th this is the point. So let's go back to the uh, examples in the, the Google Drive, right? Um, so let me close this and, and we'll go to the Google Drive. So Nina, when you say it starts somewhere in the middle, where does it start here? And where's the middle? Well, not, I'm just noticing like in the last couple of examples that they haven't been starting like in the beginning and that's usually where I look for it. Well, so- like the first couple paragraphs, but it's- Okay, so let's look for a second at the, at the, to answer your question about that, because I think you're getting at something important, is where does the nut graph actually occur, right? So if we look at the Filkins examples, now these are all excerpts. I'm not giving you the whole story, right? But how far down, I mean, I'm just giving yeah. you the first few paragraphs. So how far down, say in the in in one example, does the um, nut graph begin? Um, Carly, are you with us? Yes. Okay. So, um, Nina, are you are you pulled over somewhere where you can look at the text? Um, no, but you're on my lap, so. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, you'd have to be able to look at the text to see. But like, uh, Carly, with this first example, um, do you want to read it out loud and then say where the where the nut graph comes in? I'm um, sure. Okay. The threat of death hung so heavily over the election rally held this week on the fifth floor of the General Factory for Vegetable Oil that the speakers refused to say whether they were candidates at all. Too dangerous, said Hussein Ali, who solicited votes for the United Iraqi Alliance, a party fielding dozens of candidates for the election here. It's a secret. And then when Mr. Ali and his colleagues left escorted by men with guns, so goes the election campaign unfolding across Iraq, a country simultaneously set to embark on an American-backed political experiment while withering under a Gullerian insurgency dead set on dis distributing the experiment. With only two weeks to go to, to before the vote scheduled for January 30th, Gullerians have stepped up their attacks and driven most candidates deep indoors and on Saturday, the authorities said that they would restrict traffic and set cordons around polling places on election day. Okay, so As where does the where does the nut graph begin? Um, I would say with only two weeks to go. Mm. 
know. Are you sure? Is it? Did any of you guys see it beginning differently? Is it the first one? The first paragraph? Because it kind of like says what's going on in the first paragraph. Well, so it's goes at the like scene at the at the vegetable oil factory, but we just know that there there's there's an election rally, and that they're at this vegetable factory and that it's dangerous. But where do we actually start getting into a bigger picture? So Carly was just saying, that, what? So goes the election campaign. Yeah, exactly. You see, that's Carly, that's the first time where the camera sort of pulls back and we get the bigger mm -hmm. picture, yeah. right? Okay, so now to, to so uh, Nina had asked, is it kind of in the middle, right? If we look, now let's compare. So look at how, how, how far in that is. How many paragraphs is that? It's about three paragraphs or about what, 10 sentences, eight to 10 sentences into the story. Now let's look at the example of altered oceans. Where does the nut graph begin here? What, what's going on with these, op these opening paragraphs here? What's this about? Um, let me see. Maybe we should have a couple of you guys, guys read it. Aaron, are you there? Yeah. All right, do you wanna read the first three paragraphs? Okay. Uh, the fireweed began each spring as tufts of hairy grill and spread across the sea floor, sea floor fast enough to cover a football field in an hour. When fishermen touched it, their skin broke out in searing welts, their lips blistered and peeled, their eyes burned and swelled shut. Water that splashed from their nets spread the inflammation to their legs and torsos. It comes up like little boils, said Randolph Van Dyke, a fisherman whose powerful legs are pocked with scars. At nighttime, you can feel them burning. I tried everything to get rid of them. Nothing worked. Okay, so have we gotten to the um, nut graph yet? No. Okay, um, so Krista, do you see where she left off? Um, no, where did she leave off? She left off with nothing worked. Are you looking at the? Yeah. So can you read the next three graphs from sure. here to botany lab? As the weed blanketed miles of the bay over the last decade, it's, it stained fishing nets a dark purple and left them coated with a powdery residue. When fishermen tried to shake it off the webbing, their coats constricted and they gasped for air. After one man bit a fishing line in two, his mouth and his tongue uh, swelled so badly that he couldn't eat solid food for a week. Others made an even more painful mistake, neglecting to wash the residue off their hands before re relieving themselves over the sides of the boat boats. Uh, for a time, embarrassment kept them from talking publicly about their condition. When they finally did speak up, authorities dismissed their complaints until a bucket of the hairy weed made it to the University of Queensland's Marine Botany Lab. Okay, so Krista, have we gotten to the alternative lead, I mean, to the nut graph yet? I don't believe so. All right. So what's going on here, you guys? We're still all the way down here and we haven't gotten to the nut graph yet. So is that because we always have the nut graph in the middle? I mean, if you go back to this, you know, this other example, which is the Filkins lead, it starts right here. So what's the deal? Are these following the same rule in terms of length? What's a clue that maybe they are actually following the same thing? Are we still at the beginning of this? Look, it's a six part series, right? And this story itself goes on and I think I may have cut it off here, but this story itself is four pages long. 
So do you guys get what I'm getting at? Where does the actual alternative, I mean, where does the actual nut graph start here? Who can find it? Is it in many places? Yes. So it's still the beginning though, right? Right, because it's the beginning of a six part story, right? So the where you put the nut graph is proportional to the length of what you're writing. So if you're writing a much longer thing, you can open up with a much longer anecdotal or alternative lead, right? Um, so let's just um, wrap this up by taking a look at these questions of nut graphs. And why don't you guys, um, we answered a bunch of these first ones, right? Is it clearly identifiable? And if not, why, what's confusing? So we did look at one confusing example this morning, right? The first one, with that, the, the leaf and the bug or whatever, it was not really very clear where that started. And you could argue that that makes the story a bit confusing, right? Because you don't really know what it, the story is about. Um, so um, how about let's answer a few of these questions here. Take a, a good look and take five minutes to, let's see, Krista and Aaron and Isabella, why don't you guys look at um, the Altered Oceans one? And Carly and Nate and Ashley, why don't you guys look at, um, answer a, a couple of these questions, starting with what's the connection, uh, looking at the, the Filkins ones, and see if we can discuss this uh, after, I don't know, let's give it it's 11.19 now, so let's give it till 11.25 and then see where we're at. So just do the next handful of, what's the connection between the lead and neck graph? Where is the camera? Um, does the neck graph put things in context? And if so, how? You know, this, this next question kind of overlaps with that. Where's the background and history? So for our um, project, it would be pretty early on though, yeah, because it's not a huge paper. Exactly. Yeah, you want to think, you want your, your nut graph to be proportional. So if you're only writing 800 words, how, how early do you think you want your nut graph? Probably like... 250. Uh, 300 words at most. Yeah. Right. Maybe, maybe even between 150 and 250, depending on your alternative lead. I mean, because once you're at 300 words, you're almost at halfway down the story. So I would say maybe, you know, between 150 and 250 words is where your nut graph should start.
Okay, so give you guys one more minute to look at this. All right, so um, let me ask you, let's go, I, I guess, start with Ashley and go back around. So um, Ashley, pulling this up, um, were you able to answer any of these questions? Maybe I should pull up the questions. Hold on, let me open both. Um, so here's the... Here's the leads and then the questions. Here are the questions. So let me put one next to the other. We can look at both. So, um, Ashley, what did you what did you find? What's the connection between maybe let's look at the we kind of talked about the first one. So did you were you able to look at the second example, Ashley? Um, I only looked at the first one, but I can look at it really quickly. Okay. Well, what did you let's start with the first one. What did you find is the connection between the um, opening anecdote and the nut graph? Um, I don't, I had a really hard time with this because it's really short, but, um, maybe like the election, cause they talk about that in the nut graph and the lead. Um, All right. Um, Nate, did you have, uh, any insights into either this one or the second one in terms of the connection between the the way that they opened and the the nut graphs. Uh, I don't have any insights. <laughs> okay. Um, did you look at the second example? I did not. Okay. Um, all right. Um, did you guys look at the context? Did you try and answer any of these questions? Um, for the second one, yeah. would, the nut, would the nut graph be now the American military or would it be the paragraph below that? Um, no, I think it would be now the American military. Mm -hmm. Right. So what's the what's the connection between the first two paragraphs and the second one? In other words, what were the choices that were made by Dexter Filkins, who wrote it about how to about what to do with his anecdote with his opening thing? What did he do? He's uh, intentionally creating the juxtaposition and really driving home his paradoxical imperative uh, thing that he says in the nut graph, because the opening is how the military went in and destroyed, did some demo on the city. And now he's talking about the military's responsibility to rebuild it. Um, so the first two uh, paragraphs really help to uh, highlight paradox is it a story is it a story yeah what do you mean by that i mean the opening paragraphs are they do they tell a story yeah do they what's the story that uh talking about the owner of one house 
Well, the, there's a thing, there's a sentence about owners of one house, but th that, that isn't really a story, right? Is there a beginning and middle and end like we would recognize to a story? If it's not a story, what is it? What are those two paragraphs? How would you describe what they are? I don't know the word for it, but wouldn't it be like like factual, like what? I don't know the word. Um, it's a picture, doesn't he? Yeah. He, he paints a scene with his words, right? So this is an example of, so in other words, when I ask what's the relationship between these opening paragraphs and the, and the nut graph, these opening paragraphs create a vivid picture in our brains. And then the nut graph is about, it, and what's the picture of? Um, the... Uh, when the owners of one house near the farthest southern boundary of this uh, city return, they will find a crater 40 feet across and eight feet deep with one wall still standing and recognizable pieces of a ceiling strewn beside it. A broken kebab stand, its canopy collapsed, its two wheels exposed, leans crazily over the lip of one crater. What's he describing? The entire street in this district looks about the same. On Monday morning, after they had seemingly been crushed the day before, insurgents began firing from windows, bunkers, and piles of rubble, setting off a five-hour long gun battle. The street, once flat, had been hit with so many 500-pound ba ba uh, bombs that it looks like the zone of a collision between oceanic ice sheets with huge dips and shelves of pavement and soil. What's he describing? Like the the town or whatever like the area that the rebels destroyed yeah what kind of an impression is he making about it um it doesn't sound like kako ako right yeah it's destroyed yeah so he's painting this scene of just incredible destruction right then what's his point in the nut graph the american military is rebuilding what the rebels destroyed. Yeah, they have to rebuild it, right? And that job. So that's what he's juxtaposing, right? He paints a picture of destruction. And then he says, now the American military faces the urgent but almost paradoxical imperative of rebuilding the city it just destroyed, right? Um, what's the relationship going back to the first one between the, does this, paint a picture or does it tell a story? Carly, did you take a look at these? Yeah, um, I would say you'd it tells say, a story. You'd say it tells a story? And how would you describe that story? Um, what's, it, what's the story? There's a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? I think so. It just kind of describing what's happening, I guess. Right. What What do we learn from those opening paragraphs about what's happening? The threat of death hung so, uh, so heavily over the election rally held this week uh, that the speakers refused to say whether there were candidates at all. Too dangerous. You know, it's a secret. And then Mr. Alley and his colleagues left, escorted by men with guns. That's the end of the story that he tells, right? So you see the beginning and the middle and the end. We learned that there was this threat over the thing. They showed up and then they called it off and walked away, right? Um, what's the relationship between that and the nutcraft? That's a little bit, it's more specific and then it gets into like what's actually happening everywhere. Yeah, about all the challenges that are faced with this uh, under threat, right? With all the dangers of the election. So um, Isabella, um, when you look at the Altered Oceans one. Yeah. What's the 
Is that a story? I'd say it's more of a story than the other, the fixings lead, the other one about Iraq, but I would say it also kind of describes like what's happening and it kind of paints a picture. Right. So what does the story, the opening story tell us? It basically tells us like, it kind of describes how there's this like fireweed in Australia that it turns out is like harmful and damaging to our bodies. But like at first, like no one realizes it. And then finally they take it to a lab at the University of Queensland. And then they realize that it really is like dangerous. Right, what happens at the lab? Um, let me pull up. They do like, they put like samples in and then they can see that like, because of like the strains of like cyanobacteria, which is like uh, related to like modern day bacteria and like algae that was like that flourished like around 2.7 billion years ago. Right, well, it says here they put it in, um, what does it say? Samples placed in a drying oven gave off fumes so strong that professors and students ran out of the building and into the street choking and coughing. So they mm -hmm. tried to study it, right? When they finally yeah. brought it into the lab and they tried to dry it out and the stuff was so toxic that it emptied out the building. Yeah. It kind of paints a picture where at the beginning, like, I guess all these fishermen were like, get hot, like they couldn't eat solid food or they were getting like, their hands were getting like, you know, damaged by it. But then there was like, nobody believed them. And then once they did at the university, then, then they could really see like what these fishermen were like talking about, I guess. Right. Cause they, when they, as soon as they tried to study it, they, mm -hmm. they emptied out the entire building. It was so tough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so how does that relate to then, what's the nut graph about? Um, the nut graphs, in many places, the atolls of the Pacific, the shrimp beds of the Eastern seaboard, the fjords, the fjords of Norway, some of the most advanced forms of ocean life are struggling to survive with the most primitive that are thriving and spreading. And then I think it kind of talks about like, like it kind of paints a picture, I'd say like in the beginning, like it talks about like, there's this sort of like firestorm weed. And then it kind of talks about like overall, like in the oceans around the world that it could possibly like, there could be something like just as damaging or just as like, or the same thing. Well, it says here, scientists evoke a scenario of evolution running in reverse, returning to the primeval seas hundreds of millions of years ago. Uh, Jeremy B.C. Jackson, a marine ecologist and paleontologist uh, says we are witnessing the rise of slime. So mm -hmm. it's a return to this primordial stuff because of pollution, right? Because yeah. of the alterations in the oceans. Um, so do you guys see what I'm getting at with all these examples? What, what are you getting out of this? What have you learned uh, from going over these today? First of all, how, how do we determine how to write one of these in terms of length? Make it proportionate to um, That's right. how long your paper is. Yeah. And second of all, will just any anecdote or any vivid picture do, do you think? Well, does it have to be a story, first of all? No, it doesn't, right? Because we saw in that Dexter, Dexter Filson's example, this isn't really a story, right? It's just a, a description of destruction, right? So you can paint a picture. You don't necessarily have to tell a story. But will any picture or any story do? This is why I asked, what's the relationship between the story and the picture? You guys see what I'm getting at? What does the relationship tend to be? How would you guys describe it? Like relevant and the nut graph kind of talks about what you talked about in the lead, but then makes it more like broad. 
not broad, but um, just like overall. Right. The the anecdote pulls us in and captures our attention about something, but then the the nut graph draws out a central point of what first caught our attention. Yeah, see what I'm saying? So how many of you guys think, um, I mean, the, the alternative lead in nut graph, you guys are supposed to have a draft of that today. Let's just go quickly around the room and hear how people are doing with that and any questions you would have for the group about it. Krista, how about you? Do you have an idea yet for yours? For our final project? Yeah, for your alternative lead in nut graph. Yeah, we actually, right before class, just did like a really good interview with um, one of the professors at UH about like the economics of small businesses. Uh -huh. And so I think we're gonna kind of, as soon as we visit a like interview a small business owner, I think that's gonna be our anecdotal lead. Right. Um, so you guys don't have, does anything jump to mind yet? Like if you had to write one right now based on the research you've done, would you have one? I don't think it's going to be anecdotal, like un until we um, officially like go in and meet the person we're setting up with. Right. But uh, it could be like a normal lead, like we could come up with something like that. Like a basic news lead? Yeah, but we kind of wanted to do the anecdotal. So I think we're kind of holding off until we have that interview. Yeah, I think you, you guys need a an alternative lead, you know. Um, Aaron, how about you? We started an alternative lead based off of an anecdote we got from one of our interviews, mm -hmm. but we're still waiting on a couple more interviews to add, but we wanna kind of tie it all together somehow with an alternative lead. We're still working on it though. We do have a draft. Right. Um, can you, it, so you don't, do you have, does anything jump to mind yet as an anecdote that looks like it, you could use it? Um, we do have a possible one uh -huh. about um, one of the athletes we interviewed and um, a story she had from like when she weren't, wasn't practicing like during the break. Mm -hmm. Um, and and why why did that seem like a good anecdote? Um, it was she had had a like an interesting perspective of um, like she's really positive about how her season was getting canceled, and so it was really interesting to look at the different perspectives from all the athletes mm -hmm. of like how they felt about it because there are a lot of them. Are like a little more negative and like kind of disappointed about it but hers was a little different because she was more of a positive perspective that's interesting um well you guys are are you guys kind of focused on the idea of the kind of what's missing or how this is different um given that you know nobody can get together it's all you know happening with the pandemic Um, a little bit, yeah. Like we've been asking our, like the athletes, how they were still connected to their team, like if their team was doing like Zoom meetings or anything like that too. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that's probably your strongest angle and you should look for examples that show that really vividly, right? Okay. Um, Isabella, how about you? Um, I kind of started like a lead and like a nut graph, but I think after like going through this exercise in this class, I think I definitely need to revise mine. But in terms of like interviews and stuff, I haven't really started yet, but I'm planning on doing that within the next few days. Okay. Uh, Carly, how about you? Yeah, um, I'm actually working with Aaron. So we were kind of thinking about like, like 
gearing it towards how um, what athletes are doing during the break and how they're like getting back into things. Um, so we we're thinking we might change it, but right now we have the story from the athlete um, about what she was doing during the break. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, like I said, I would, um, I would, I would just look for examples. I mean, I know having talked just from my limited experience of talking to students, you know, I've talked to water polo students who aren't going in the water, certainly not together, but you know, really at all. And football players who um, are doing tryouts without footballs. Um, so I think that those kinds of examples are, are, you know, pretty vivid in their own way. They shouldn't be hard to find if you guys can talk to a fair number of athletes. So, all right. Um, and Nate, how about, uh, I know you're working with, um, uh, with, let's see, Krista. Um, do you have any ideas yet of your own on this? Our final project? Yeah, for your alternative lead. Yeah, I mean, pretty much exactly what Krista said. We're, uh, we've been working pretty since, you know, after we had our, our uh, after we talked to you, we understood that it was a little bit more of a complex story. So we've been doing a lot of background research um, and interviews and stuff. But for alternative lead, we definitely want to keep that uh, personal with our when, if, uh, when we do our, our uh, small business interview. Yeah, I mean, you, like that. you already have a fair amount of knowledge of, of what's going on with the businesses, right? So does anything leap to mind to you as an anecdote that could open that up? Yeah, I think uh, our what we're uh, assuming is going to happen is uh, we're, we're kind of basing it off of a story that was in the Pittsburgh Post Gazette uh, mm -hmm. about how like a, a small business owner uh, was running uh, uh, a barbecue place, I think, or something like that. Uh, how, you know, without the PPP and stuff, or with the PPP, he was able to stay open and he had all these big plans and then pandemic happened and uh, he was able to just stay afloat. But then when, you know, if there's not a second bill, uh, all of these like people, his employees, all of his ideas and stuff, are not going to be able to happen again. So we're probably going to do a similar style where we're going to talk to a, a small business, like a sole proprietor, which I'm assuming based on a lot of experience, they're always going to have like a ton of ideas and be very passionate. And then they'll give us some good quotes. And then we'll be like, oh, but what if there's no, you know, second stimulus? And then they'll get sad about that. And then, you know, that's our, that's our anecdote. And then that's, you know, that's the small business. That's the state of the sole proprietor. And then, you know, we, we go up in terms of, talking to economic professors and then uh Krista's looking at the politics behind it and so that, that that's our kind of way of doing some explanatory I mean just in terms of formula if this person tried something specific right with their tables or with some kind of new thing they were selling or some way of setting up their restaurant like with the tables and that gave them hope and then it didn't work out that would be the kind of arc you're talking about, right? Or it worked, but it didn't, in the, in the longer term, it failed because of the, the broader economic challenges. Sure, I mean, there's the direct innovations related to, to COVID, but even, even before that, you know, like a lot of these uh, small businesses in the beginning of 2020 had all these cool ideas for their business that, you know, they weren't able to try out and then you know, getting some of those ideas and that, you know, those passionate quotes about how they had these, all these well, plans. Hold on. Don't do some of these ideas. The idea is you focus, right? So you, you tell a specific story at the opening. Don't begin it like an essay. Begin with a story of an idea that they tried and then didn't work out. You see what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it, we're, we're, probably going to zoom in on one but when we do the interview yeah we'll, we'll probably hear a few stories yeah i mean you're gonna have to sift through but at the end of the day uh you you commit to a you know a specific story or idea right 
or you paint a picture. Um, but it's all with the, the alternative lead, it's all about the specificity and the vividness of it. So. Yeah, no, that's uh, what we're gonna go for. I think, we'll, I think we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of background research and stuff now. I'm pretty, pretty confident we'll get it. We'll have a yeah. pretty good final piece. All right. Um, well, I'll see you guys uh, this Thursday. I'll set up. Sorry, I didn't get the um, announcement up until the last minute, but I'll set that up now for y'all. Um, you know, for Thursday, and I'll see you guys Thursday, and we'll we'll pick up on the next set of skills. I'm just trying to go through one set after another. I think uh, on Thursday um, we'll do a troubleshooting thing um, where we look at your story overall and we see where you know, where you're good and where you still have holes to fill. So we'll do that, okay? Um, any Thank questions you. from you guys? All right, I'll see you guys uh, Thursday. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Thanks.